Last week, it was announced that in the last year, Bolton experienced the highest rent rise of any UK area at 14.8%, which puts the average monthly rent, the average weekly rent, sorry, at £178, roughly 37% of the average wage for this area, which during the same period rose by 8%. The recommended proportion of spending on housing is roughly 33% of income. Obviously, if that discrepancy continues, that percentage of people's income is just going to rise and rise and rise. That is one of the things that we look at in the news and think, that's not fair, that's not just. There are people making profits which outstrip the ability of their tenants to live a comfortable, not luxurious, but a reasonably comfortable life. And we all know that the world is full of injustices at the moment. But what does this have to do with worship? What comes into your head when I say the word worship? Music? Gathering together on a Sunday, singing, dancing. Yet in our reading from Amos, God says, Away with the noise of your songs. I will not listen to the music of your harps. So have we got it all wrong? And yet, 1 Chronicles 16.23 says, Sing to the Lord of the earth. Jeremiah 20.13 says, Sing to the Lord. Isaiah 12.5, Sing praises to the Lord. Acts 16.25, Paul and Silas are in prison, praying and singing hymns to God. Colossians 3.16, we are told to sing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. So what's going on? Those five scriptures were just a very small sample. There are dozens and dozens and dozens of scriptures which talk about singing, playing music in worship to God. So where's the problem? What on earth does any of this have to do with the issue of high rents and general injustice? The clue is there in Amos. Away with the noise of your songs. I will not listen to the music of your harps, but let justice roll on like a river, righteousness like a never-failing stream. What matters to God is not the music and the singing, it's the motivation behind our worship. I'm sure most of us have said at one time or another, I was so blessed by this morning's worship, or that song really lifted my heart. That's not a bad thing. It's not wrong to be blessed by music. I believe it is a gift from God, which he wants us to enjoy and to benefit from. But the main purpose of our worship has to be to glorify God, not to make ourselves feel better. And this is where Jesus' words to the Samaritan woman come in. She challenged the Jewish belief that God could only be worshipped at the temple in Jerusalem. Jesus' response is that it's not where we worship that matters. It's our motivation. What matters is truth, 
and the Spirit's guidance. Not where, not when, but who and how and why. If we love God, worship should be present in every moment of our lives, wherever we are, whatever we're doing, whoever we're with. So what does this mean in practice? There's been a little theme wandering around church a bit the last few weeks. I believe it started in Alpha several weeks ago now. And it's come up in several conversations that I've had with different people. Road rage. Many years ago, and I'm not going to name names, somebody who's no longer part of this church learned to drive. Now, this particular person was a very quiet, softly spoken person. And the first time that I got in the car with her, I couldn't quite believe my ears. Because she was not quiet and softly spoken. And like, okay, I thought I knew you. When we object to how somebody else is driving, and I'm not necessarily talking about getting up and throwing a brick through a car window, the, dr the other driver doesn't even need to hear what we are saying. What do our passengers hear? And more importantly, what does God hear when we are channeling at somebody who's not been as alert as they should be, perhaps made a risky move? What does God hear? even if you don't say the words out loud. God hears what is in our hearts. Do our words, our thoughts, glorify God in that situation. Challenge for anybody who finds themselves in that sort of situation. Pray a blessing on that other driver. Discovered, and I am no expert at this, but praying a blessing when you are really cheesed off with someone actually does wonders for your own mood. When we pray a blessing on others, we get a blessing ourselves. What about other situations where we're tempted to be sarcastic? Where we're a little short-tempered, impatient? Is what others hear from us, what God hears from us, is it worship? And what about our general behavior? We had a wonderful night at Farnworth Cricket Club on Friday night with Tony Vino. Um, We have, over the last year or two, built up a really good relationship with the cricket club, particularly with the manager. And she, I asked her last n on Friday night as we were packing up, um, what do I owe you? What do we owe you for tonight? And the answer was nothing. Nothing. 
the answer is always nothing. I always ask. And she always says nothing. Because we have a relationship. Because we clean up after ourselves, so she doesn't have to get the cleaner in to do it. Saves her some money. And we're generally pretty well behaved. Don't cause a ruckus. Don't make too much mess. The kids' Christmas party was probably an exception to that, but yeah, it was kids. But we cleaned it, cleaned up as much as we could. That relationship is born out of what she sees in us and from us. When we go in on a Monday night for our team meeting, just sit in a corner, chat. Um, interact a little bit with, with some of the folk that we know. What do your work colleagues see in you? What behaviour do they see from you? What do your neighbours see? Is your, behav your behaviour Glorifying to God. Is it worship? And how do we express our love for God in our actions towards others? How do we make others feel? Are we encouraging, building people up? Or do we even non undeliberately, if that's a word, I mean, it is now, um, if we put people down, maybe without meaning to, but because we're careless in our thoughts and our words and our actions, What if you've got a disagreement with your neighbour? How do we handle that? Do we go wading in there all angry because they've pulled the wrong bin off the street and we've got their mucky, dirty one? Or do we leave them feeling that they've met with God, even if they have no idea who God is? Are our daily actions acts of worship? For me, this is the hard one. Attitude. I can't lie about this because my husband's sat there and my daughter's sat there and they'll both pull me up, especially Rachel. Are you inclined to be moody? To take out your bad day on others? Is your presence at work, in your home, with your neighbours, like sweet, sweet honey to our families, to our colleagues, or does it leave a bitter taste? Are we inclined to give those who have wronged us or who we think have wronged us a taste of their own medicine? Is our atti attitude glorifying to God?
Mine frequently isn't. And I know that if I were to start singing a worship song, when I'm in like that, God would say, I don't want to hear it. Sort yourself out, and then I'll have your worship song. What I want now is an attitude that is worshipful, that is glorifying. I think a couple of weeks ago, Sandra mentioned that uh, we'd been at prayer day at the Message Trust. Um, I think it was the same session, with the same meeting that we learned that song in. And we both smelled something. Now, that sounds weird. I don't know if anybody else in the building smelt it. I was conscious of it before lunch, and then Sandra mentioned it after lunch. He smelled it slightly differently than I did. For me, it was smoky smell, but that kind of fragrant wood smoke smell. Sandra, because she's a, a flower sort of person, had a sense of, of a floral tinge to it. Well, But for me, it was primarily just this smoky wood smoke, beautiful, beautiful wood smoke smell. And I believe that was the aroma of our worship in that place that day. Fire alarms would have gone off if there'd been a fire. And I'm told that even if you burn toast in that place, fire alarms go off. It was something supernatural. 2 Corinthians 2.15 says, We are to God the pleasing aroma of Christ among those who are being saved and those who are perishing. At least seven times in Leviticus, the sacrifice is described as being a soothing aroma to the Lord. Our lives are our sacrifice to God. Is it a pleasing aroma, a soothing aroma, an acceptable act of worship? Or is it a stench? Micah 6 verse 8 says, He has shown you, O mortal, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? To act justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. That's all that God asks of us. To walk with him. That is the worship that he asks of us. Justice, mercy, and to walk with God. There lies worship in spirit and in truth. Now, I know that there are people in this room and people watching online whose minds will be processing this or trying to process some of this and thinking, I can't do that. I can't be that good. I'm not perfect. I've already said, join the club. That attitude one, I've... I've really got to do some work on that. And I know it. But we've just sung, you never wanted perfect. You just wanted my heart. God knows 
that perfection is out of our reach, utterly impossible. What he wants is a heart inclined towards him. There is a line in The Lion, the Witch and the Wardrobe, and I've not written it down, so I hope I quote it, but I was going to use it, and then I decided not to, and I've decided to. <laughs> um, where Aslan is restoring the animals who have been turned to stone by the witch. And there's a giant, big stone giant, and even Aslan can only reach, you know, can't, can't, can barely even reach his knees. So he breathes on this giant's feet. And the children are like, oh, what's happening? And Aslan says, once the feet are put right, the rest will follow. Once thou hearts are right, the rest will follow. It takes time. We are works in progress. But if our hearts are inclined towards God, if our hearts are seeking that connection with God, that relationship with God, going deeper and deeper day by day, our mouths will follow. Our actions will follow. Our attitudes, even mine, will follow eventually. God does not judge our mouths and he does not judge our mistakes. He looks into our hearts and asks, what is there? What is in that heart? True worship is an outpouring of our heart's love for God in every single aspect of our lives. Every minute of every day, every person we interact with, every situation we find ourselves in, every place we find ourselves in. is a place for worship. Every moment of our lives is a time for worship. Everything we do, everything we say, everything we feel is an opportunity for worship. but more than anything else. Our hearts should be the source of our worship, the source of our actions, our words, our thoughts, our behavior, our attitudes, our whole life should be an act of worship. We're going to sing again in a minute. But if you're thinking, my life is not an act of worship, in any way, shape, or form. I'm not sure about this God stuff. I'm not connected to God. I don't have a relationship with God. And if you're thinking, I'm up for a challenge, come and get that connection. Start that journey with God. 
you're thinking, I don't really like who I am right now very much. Let's give God a go at helping me sort it out. Come. We'll pray with you and get you on that journey. But maybe you're already on that journey and still thinking, yeah, I don't like where I am very much. I gave God my life and then I yanked a whole lot of it back again. My attitude stinks. My words are not glorifying. My, my behavior does not demonstrate the love that I have for God. My life does not, is not one that promotes justice and mercy. If you'd like prayer for any of the things that I've mentioned or for anything else where you think I am not glorifying God in this area of my life, Ola and I will be at the front here to pray. And I know there are people here at the, today who are experiencing some significant health challenges. Come, we'll pray for you, pray with you. Because God is always beside us. Even when we're getting it wrong. Even when our attitude is rubbish. Even when our words are disrespectful and dishonoring. When our actions and our attitudes do not reflect God's love. God is still there beside us. We've sung this morning. I won't be quiet. My God is alive. How can we keep it inside? Let's not hide the God who loves us. We're going to sing, but if you'd like worship, please come.